Good evening. I'm Kelly Gear Ripken, National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Women's Journey, thank you for joining this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well being through health education. October is Breast to Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosis among women in the United States, with more than 270,000 new diagnoses each year. Of these, 10% are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. As of 2017, it was estimated that approximately 155,000 women in the US were living with metastatic breast cancer, or are known as MBC, often on long-term therapy. Tonight, we are joined by two women who have devoted their careers to women living with breast cancer. First is medical oncologist, Dr. Karen Smith, assistant professor of oncology, Director of Breast Medical Oncology at Sibley Memorial Hospital, Director of the Young Women with Breast Cancer Program at the Kimmel Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins, and Co-Director of Hope at Hopkins Clinic. Our second guest is Professor Lily Shockney, who is a Johns Hopkins University Distinguished Service Professor of Breast Cancer, former Administrative Director at the Johns Hopkins Breast Cancer, and former Administrative Director of Johns Hopkins Cancer Survivorship programs. She also is an author, nationally recognized humorist, and two-time breast cancer survivor. So please use the Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to Dr. Smith and Professor Shockney, who will respond to many of your questions during the last 15 minutes of tonight's conversation. Our webcast will conclude around 8 p.m. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for the production assistance. You can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I'm pleased to begin tonight's conversation with Dr. Smith and Professor Lily Shockney. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, both of you for tonight. We've got a lot to get started with, so I guess we should just jump right in, right? Yes. Go for it. <laughs> So let's uh, start with the basics. Can you tell us what is metastatic breast cancer and are there different types? Sure, I can take that one. Uh, so when we say that uh, cancer has metastasized or become metastatic, what that means is that cancer cells from the original site, the breast, escaped typically via the bloodstream or the lymph system and have set up shop and grown in other parts of the body. So the situation is that there are breast cancer cells, for example, in the liver or the lungs or the bone or any other location outside of the breast. Uh, there are three main types of breast cancer. Um, the first one is hormone sensitive or estrogen and or progesterone receptor positive. And that means the cancer cells express receptors for the female hormones, estrogen and progesterone. The second main subtype is what we call HER2 positive. And that happens at about 20% or so of the time. And the cancer cells overexpress uh, something called HER2. And the final type is triple negative. And that means that the cancer cells do not express either of the female hormone receptors or HER2. And so one of the things that is important regarding those prognostic factors is that a biopsy needs to be done of one of the metastatic sites, whether that be, uh, as Dr. Smith was saying, liver, lung, bone, uh, in order to determine what that ER, PR, and HER2 receptors are, we can't rely on what it was originally in the breast tumor uh, itself, that it may have actually changed when it migrated. So is there, a, is there evidence of what causes metastasis? So the, the thinking is that some uh, small cells that are often uh, too small to detect on standard scans or CAT scans made an escape basically, and that over time they either grow slowly or they kind of set up shop and rest for a while in another part of the body and then start to grow again. Um, I don't think we fully know what makes some cancers metastasize versus others not, but that's the general thinking. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I was surprised to learn that most women who develop metastatic breast cancer, they're initially diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, which really is, is really deceiving, right? So can mm -hmm. you tell us who is at risk for developing metastatic, the, the different types of breast cancer and, and, uh, and when it typically develops? Sure, I can start with that one. So, um, uh, so when we say early stage breast cancer, we typically refer to breast cancer that is just detectable in the breast or maybe also in the close by lymph glands. And when we say metastatic, as we said earlier, it means that it is in other body parts. So the vast majority of pa patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer are diagnosed at an early stage and most of them undergo treatment. And the goal of that treatment is cure. So eradicating the cancer and any tiny cells that may have made an escape and that are setting sh up shop to grow. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, some or men with breast cancer still develop a metastatic recurrence over time. Um, in general, we think that the risk of metastasis developing is related to the features of the cancer that are present at diagnosis. So for example, a patient, patient who has a larger tumor or a tumor that has spread to the lymph glands, especially to multiple lymph glands, would have a higher risk of developing metastases over time than a patient who had a very small and node negative tumor that did not involve the lymph glands. Similarly, it's also related to the underlying biology of the cancer, meaning did those cells look aggressive when the pathologist looked under the microscope and um, also to those ER and PR and HER2 receptors. So there's a lot of things that factor into it and uh, predicting a recurrence of with metastasis is a very imperfect science uh, at this point, unfortunately, which I think is very hard uh, to live with a certain degree of uncertainty. So, so how is metastasis most often diagnosed and how long after the initial breast cancer diagnosis? Uh, so the most frequent way that a metastasis is diagnosed is if a patient feels unwell in some way and something may hurt or may have fatigue or cough or headache or something like that. The specific symptoms are very variable because they really depend on what part or parts of the body are affected. So there's not one specific symptom to look out for. But really, anyone who has a history of breast cancer who develops any symptom that feels out of the range of normal should mm -hmm. talk to their doctor to see if it could potentially be a sign that is concerning for metastasis. If someone has any concerning symptoms, the oncologist will typically order imaging tests to try to evaluate if metastasis is present. And then if something is identified to go ahead and do a biopsy as Lily referred to. I think the second part of your question referred to the timing of development of metastasis. And that's an important point um, because it can be a bit different depending on the different types of breast cancer. Um, for example, hormone receptor positive breast cancer can unfortunately have a development of metastasis over a very long period of time. It has a very low, but very long risk period. Whereas triple negative breast cancer, if it is going to recur, it most often does so within the first few years after diagnosis. I think too that one of the, uh, one of the things that we try to emphasize with patients is don't assume that a new ache or pain is cancer. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if someone's been uh, laying carpet in their living room and they had to pick up the sofa and the lazy boy rocker recliner and such, and then the next day and the following day, their back hurts, mm -hmm. that makes sense to us. Their back should hurt. Uh, right. So <laughs> kind of doing that inventory of, is there anything that I've done recently to cause this new ache or pain so that those things can be ruled out? Otherwise, 
a patient may be reacting every, to every single thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a woman who mm -hmm. called me and said, my breast cancer is now in my toe. I said, tell me about that. <laughs> and so she took a picture of it and sent it to me. And she said, it's my left toe. My breast cancer was in my left breast. I've been out doing power walking. And obviously it has, you know, met metastasized down into my big toe. When in fact she had gout. As soon as I saw her toe, I knew she had yeah. gout. She was thrilled to have gout. Um, she gives everybody new perspective um, of, uh, of I can have metastatic disease or I can have gout, though I've never seen toe cancer before. But uh, we need to make sure that we can rule out other things before mm -hmm. any of us kind of jump to the conclusion. And, and we don't want her worrying and fretting every day. There are women that are worrying and fretting every day that, that their cancer is going to pop up somewhere. And that means that they're not living they're just existing. They're not, they're not enjoying their life that mm -hmm. at, at this point in time has been saved. Well, Professor Shockney, I would imagine that that's even uh, just another whole issue on um, mentally, you know, how to handle all of this. And, you know, what, what advice would you give about that? Because that's really something that once you hear the shocking news and then you're living with it, I can't, you know, I can't imagine, like you're saying, every tiny little thing, but so maybe you could speak a little bit on that. Yeah, so we, I always want, and I do this myself as a two-time breast cancer survivor. I'm 29 years out from my first diagnosis. And believe me, if I get a cold that won't go away, I'm like, hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and trying to figure out, is this something I need to worry about a bit more than, than I do? But um, I, I take a look to see what are we doing as individuals to try to reduce our risk because that's something that we have some control over like mm -hmm. power walking eating a healthy uh, mm -hmm. low fat diet uh, not smoking uh, not drinking and uh, and then from there I've got a new acre pain rather than jump to the conclusion this is probably cancer let me figure out is this something that I should have been expecting such as um, mm -hmm. back pain which is the most common thing that someone will report and then we need to figure out was this expected because they moved furniture or whatever that they were doing or is this uh, something that we do need to, to do some x-rays for. I, uh, I, I do emphasize to patients and I tell myself this too that if we are in the shower every morning doing an inventory of our body to figure out if we think we've got cancer today then we aren't enjoying our life. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. The doctors and nurses that took care of, of me and took care of, of, uh, of all of the hundreds of thousands of, of breast cancer survivors out there uh, did so for the purpose of that woman, and in some cases men, enjoying the rest of their life. Sure. So always put it into, into perspective. I, uh, I keep a, uh, a coffee mug downstairs that has a, uh, a cartoon drawing of Noah's Ark on it. And there's two little characters that uh, just look like little blobs that are sitting on a big rock on the shore. And they're looking at one another as they're looking at Noah's Ark, which has sailed and is way out there. And one of the little blobs says to the other one, oh crap, was that today? And <laughs> when you read on the back of the mug, it says, give every day its own perspective. So <laughs> that's what I preach. <laughs> like that. <laughs> I think it's really important to remember that the vast majority of people who are diagnosed with early stage breast cancer do not have a recurrence. The vast majority are cured. Mm -hmm. So are there signs that breast cancer or, or what signs should breast cancer survivors look for? So I, I think we've touched on some of them and there's not one specific sign, but it's uh, really anything that seems out of the range of normal for which there's no clear, obvious, you know, alternate explanation, uh, which is severe, perhaps, you know, uncomfortable enough to wake you up at night um, and which doesn't go away, kind of run its own course over you know, a week or two, um, we all get colds. And, you know, just because you had breast cancer does not mean that you won't get all the normal stuff also. Right. 
Um, I wish there was a better test uh, and a better, you know, clear cut set of signs and symptoms or blood tests that could tell us right away sure. that that doesn't exist right now. Right. It, it may be worth mentioning, you know, we, the most common type of, of breast cancer is invasive ductal carcinoma. We're looking at 80% or more of women developing that type. There's also invasive lobular uh, carcinoma. Mm -hmm. It has a tendency to not go to the same organ sites that invasive ductal does. Invasive ductal kind of has a reputation of going to the bone, going to the liver, going to the lung, uh, sometimes the brain. But uh, invasive lobular is, a, is sneakier. And uh, we'll see it in the GI tract. We may see it in the stomach. We'll may see it in the uterus, uh, in the ovaries. So the signs and symptoms for it may be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you've had something going on and it's been going on for, for more than two weeks and you can't figure out what it is, then it's time that we figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. The other thing to think about is that the different subtypes, the hormone receptor positive, the triple negative, and the HER2 positive um, also have slightly different patterns in terms of where they may metastasize if patients develop metastatic breast cancer. Uh, for example, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, the most common site is the bone, um, uh -huh. typically multiple bones. And um, triple negative uh, breast cancer or HER2 positive breast cancer, while they may certainly go to the bone also, uh, they're a little bit more likely to go to the brain. Um, her, her hormone receptor positive breast cancer would be less likely to go to the brain. So there are some other patterns that we look for too. So with that said, should breast cancer survivors, should they be screened more frequently or, or what would you recommend? So I think the best thing to do, and this is actually, there's guidelines uh, for this that are put together by um, you know, groups of experts who convene on uh, you know, national panels, but the recommendation is that after a diagnosis of breast cancer and initial treatment, that patients establish a regular follow-up schedule with their providers, typically every few months for at least five years or so. And um, during that time, most of the evaluation is by talking and assessing symptoms and physical exam. The main type of imaging or x-ray tests that we do recommend is that for women, um, other than those who've had um, bilateral or both side mastectomy, that they do continue to get their breast screen mammograms. And some women, uh, depending on their breast density or other factors may also choose to supplement that with additional breast screening, such as magnetic resonance imaging. But we do not recommend total body CAT scans or PET scans or brain scans in the absence of symptoms. We're very quick to get them if something seems worrisome, um, but there's, there's been no data that tells us that just kind of getting them in an arbitrary way, like, oh, well, it's been a year, let's get a scan, mm -hmm. do anything other than cause a lot of what we call scanxiety and um, a lot of extra radiation exposure and doesn't improve uh, how women live or the course of the disease in any way if it is detected. Mm -hmm. When I uh, was in nursing school and I was just telling my husband that I said, oh my gosh, I said this month or excuse me, last month, beginning of September, I started nursing school 50, 50, oh, 50 years ago. And uh, breast cancer survivors did get x-rayed chronically mm -hmm. uh, because that's what we did. We were always looking for, for trouble. But um, as Dr. Smith said, uh, evidence-based medicine has proven that looking and looking and looking is not a good way to find something. We can find something on an x-ray that then we want to pursue. And I, I tell people it's guilty by association. If you'd never had cancer, that little pixel dixel that we see on that scan, we would have ignored. But because you've had cancer, now we got to chase it down. And chasing it down means more imaging studies and then even a biopsy, which is not simple or fun, only to find out it was nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tell women, I don't wanna have 10 years of your life scared out of you 
because we decided to do as you requested and do a scan. So um, it really should be based on physical symptoms that a patient presents with that then would tell us, yes, we need to take a look and see if there is any trouble going on somewhere. Sure, good advice. So Dr. Smith, what are some recent advances in treatment of the different types of breast cancer? So it's been a really exciting um, you know, past few years in the field of medical oncology. If I think back to when I sort of finished fellowship versus now the number of new treatments is really staggering. I mean, the field is just exploding the number of drugs that have been approved, um, most of which extend lives is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so we're always learning, so we're always on our toes, learning how to use new, new drugs and um, allowing our patients to live for longer, hopefully until the next drugs come along. And so um, some of the advances, again, we sort of think about it in terms of those, the, the subtypes. So the hormone receptor positive, the triple negative, and the HER2 positive. So starting with hormone receptor positive, the major advances have been in the use of these targeted therapies. So we typically give anti-hormonal endocrine therapies, and now we have these targeted therapies uh, that are uh, orally administered medications such as uh, cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. And when we combine them with hormonal therapy, it essentially doubles the amount of time before the cancer grows. Uh, during treatment and before there's a need for changing the treatment to another type. And it uh, improves the amount of time overall that people live with the cancer. And we have patients who've been on these now for years. And if the first combination of hormone therapy and uh, targeted therapy ultimately does not control the cancer and the cancer grows, we switch to another option. We have loads of options. Similarly for um, uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we have had uh, successes in terms of immunotherapy and a new uh, type of drug called, for example, sesotuzumab. And HER2 positive breast cancer has been another real success story uh, along the lines of hormone receptor positive in that we have patients now for years with stable disease or all disease essentially resolved on imaging with the use of anti-HER2 agents. And we have a number of different specific medications that target that HER2 that's overexpressed. So in many cases, uh, metastatic breast cancer has become a chronic disease, much like diabetes or hypotension, it requires ongoing management and ongoing medication and assessments. But in many cases, uh, patients can live for an extended period of time on treatment. Well, that's wonderful news. Good news to hear. I, I can't imagine, um, because Lily, where, I'm sorry, Professor Shockey, okay. sorry, we, we know one another, um, that, you know, going back for how long you've, you've, you've been in medicine, um, just the advances in all of these treatments. Um, do you think age, is age a factor in considering determining treatments at all? Age is a factor no matter what stage the breast cancer is, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we have someone diagnosed who's 89 years old and in a nursing home and has uh, advanced dementia and congestive heart failure and diabetes, et cetera, mm -hmm. it would not be in her best interest for us to be treating her as if she's 35 years old and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh uh, when it comes to metastatic disease, we need to take a look at first, what are the treatment options, but also what are the other illnesses that this individual may have? It's, it's not unusual um, today, particularly patients that are over the age of 55 to have other comorbid conditions mm -hmm. um, like you know heart disease or diabetes, COPD, et cetera. So we need to balance those. We don't wanna make them worse um, but we also need to figure out how to get the disease in control. And that really is what we're talking about when it comes to metastatic breast cancer. Uh, since most women were diagnosed with an earlier stage, the mission was to have her become cancer free. That was our goal. Mm -hmm. And for those that the, that the cancer 
uh, has ended up metastasizing to other organs. Now we're not looking at having her necessarily be cancer free. We want to get this disease in control. And that's what we do with chronic illnesses. We get our hypertension in control. We get our mm -hmm. blood sugar level in control, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the same applies uh, to this. I think that because this is becoming recognized certainly by patients as being more of a chronic illness, I don't think that society understands that. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to change. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's awful for for breast cancer to be in the grocery store shopping and someone that she sees maybe every four to five months, perhaps in the grocery store, walks over to her and says, oh, you look great. Your cancer's gone, right? You're all fine now, right? Right? Because that's what that person wants to hear is that everything's fine now. Mm -hmm. and, and then the patient has to make a decision. Well, how far do I want to take this conversation? Uh, and uh, sometimes they'll blow them off. Sometimes they'll say, well, no, I'm still living with my disease. I'm always going to be on some form of treatment. Um, and that is that is the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanna make sure that patients don't feel isolated um, they're, because individuals don't understand this disease. They don't know how to have a conversation with these individuals about their regular life. It's like, don't mm -hmm. talk about the cancer all the time with her. That's, yeah. That isn't what she wants to be telling you about. Ask her about her kids, um, ask her about her job, uh, ask her about, you know, what did she do for vacation this summer, if anything, mm -hmm. uh, that, that because you know someone has stage four disease doesn't mean that the discussion needs to focus around it. So you're really touching on, you know, maintaining quality of life. And yeah. how important that is for patients living with metastatic breast cancer, um, especially who, the ones who receive long-term treatments and they can have side effects with them. So what do you suggest patients you know, do to try to maintain the quality of life? Even in that having, when you're out and people come up to you, your friends, and they, they might, they mean well, they wanna know that you're doing all right, but it does put the patient in a difficult situation then of, okay, how much should I, how much information do I really want to, to give out here? But at the same time, I want to live my life. Right. And, yeah. and we want them to be living their life. We don't want it to be solely mm -hmm. focused on treatment because that means that she's existing. She's not really living. She's not thriving. And we mm -hmm. want her to be, to be also thriving. I'm a, 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 a very strong advocate for palliative care. Now that, that terminology may scare some of the folks that are uh, on, this, uh, on this WebEx with us tonight. They go, oh my God, no, I don't want palliative care. Trust me, you do. Um, palliative care gets a bad rap and is assumed to be only associated with hospice care, with end of life care. And that is not where it's, its primary strength is in my opinion. Uh, it, it really does, and I don't like calling it palliative care. I stopped calling it that, I guess, about 17, 18 years ago now. I refer to it as quality of life preservation or quality of life restoration, because that is what uh, the doctors and nurses that specialize in palliative care are charged to do for that patient. What can we do to get these signs and symptoms into control so that they're not uh, impacting her, her quality of life, her day, uh, whether it be mm -hmm. nausea, whether it be pain, they're very talented at avoiding using opioids. Opioids is their last resort. They're going to use, they're going to do a nerve block. If you've got back pain, for example, they'll turn to that first before they're going to say here, take this prescription for opioids and your pain will go away. Well, you'll also stay asleep in your bed too. Um, right. and that's, that's not what, that's not what we want at all. So right. the, the patient needs to let the doctor know right from that first consultation when they've been diagnosed uh, with metastatic disease that she's a whole lot more than just being a stage four breast cancer patient and that her prognostic factors are X, Y, Z and that her cancer is spread to the following organs that she's a 38 year old who's a fifth grade school teacher who has a nine year old that is autistic uh, she's happily divorced 
and uh, she wants to still be teaching school and she wants to still have time with her son and to help support him with his special needs. And she wants to go to the movies and watch a chick flick with her girlfriends. She doesn't want her life totally revolving around cancer treatment and certainly not around dealing with chronic pain or chronic fatigue and other, other symptoms. So I want her to advocate for herself. I'm hoping that she has a, a navigator, but if she does not, I want her to speak up and advocate for herself and, and to say, here, here is who I am. I'm a whole lot more than what's on those medical papers and I need you to factor that in. Uh, I strongly recommend to, uh, to patients that they first let their uh, treatment team know how much do they know about their breast cancer? Because we need to make sure that they've got the right facts mm -hmm. and that they haven't actually found misinformation which is out there on the internet or could have been told by the person in the grocery store, right. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And then second, how much does she want to know about her breast cancer? Some people want to know everything up front. Others want what I call just in time information. They just feel too overwhelmed learning too much too fast. Mm -hmm. What is she hoping for right now? What is this patient hoping for? What is she most worried about right now? And then to share three things with her treatment team, three things that bring her joy, because that's part of how she's actually defining her quality of life. We want to preserve those joys. Mm -hmm. We want to promote those joys. We don't want her to have to forfeit them. Only give cancer what you need to do to get it into control. Don't let it take away any more than you. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't deserve it. And when it comes to making decisions about treatment, Treatment for treatment's sake is bad care. I talk to patients all across the country and some out of the country via email that reach out to find me on the internet, reach out to me every single day saying, I, I have been asked by my adult daughter to do one more treatment when I really don't want to. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I really want to enroll in hospice. Uh, my doctor thinks I may have four or five months um, to go and I'd like to clear my body of the medicines that are in it. I think I'll actually feel better. And yet my daughter says, well, if you love me, you'll do it for me. Mm. And I'll say, you have to tell her if she loves you that she needs to respect what you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and doing treatment because the doctor wants to do it doing treatment because a loved one says, I, I expect you to do or I want you to do it, is really not in the patient's best interest. This needs to be something that the patient agrees. Yes, I definitely want to do it. I understand why I'm doing it. I understand the benefits of it and I understand the risks of it. When risks outweigh benefit, it's time to, to have a much more thoughtful uh, and candid conversation about how do you want to spend the remainder of your life. There are still patients that are in ICUs uh, that die in an ICU uh, with stage four breast cancer. That should not be ever. Mm -hmm. We should not be having patients in an ICU. It's a heck of a way to go anyway, but that tells me that there was no conversation. Right. Now, I, I know that it can be tough having that conversation um, for reasons I may never know. I have always been comfortable having those kinds of conversations, but um, Again, the patient, I want her to advocate for herself and say, hey, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear what my goals of care are and what my life goals are. Um, and then take it from there. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's excellent advice. Very challenging and difficult, I would imagine, to tell your loved ones, this, these are my wishes. This is what I want. And um, But you're right. It's important because... It's really about them, their wishes and what they want. So, um, and maybe going in with their their care team can help as well. Would you say if they're you know having family members be with her and yes. in there, and so they so the the care the the physicians there or her, her care team are helping to kind of say to them this and this is what she's trying to say to you. Right, to support her decisions yes. 
understand yeah. her reasoning. Yeah. 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 So, well, good advice. Um, Dr. Smith, so you had mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, there's a lot of really exciting new advances in terms of treatment for metastatic breast cancer. What kinds of side effects um, confront many of these patients? So I, I think Lily touched on some of them. I think uh, fatigue is a, is a very common side effect. Um, interestingly, physical activity or exercise is one of the best strategies to combat fatigue. Mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of uh, patients also sometimes experience gastrointestinal uh, toxicities or side effects. So nausea or diarrhea or mouth sores are not infrequent. Um, hair loss is associated with some therapies. Uh, we monitor a lot of blood cell counts and sometimes patients experience low white blood cells, which are infection fighting cells or anemia or low platelets, uh, which may predispose to bleeding or needing transfusions of some sort or risks for infection with the low infection fighting cells. Uh, some of the chemotherapies or other agents can also affect some of the other blood tests in the organs, such as the kidneys or the liver. And so we typically monitor those very carefully. Some of the newer therapies have some more uh, slightly different side effect profiles than standard chemotherapy. Now that many of our newer drugs are these targeted or immune-based agents. And so we see a lot of rashes or induction sometimes of diabetes or um, autoimmune or inflammatory conditions in the different parts of the body. Mm -hmm. Side effects really run the gamut, um, but I really do think that in the vast majority of cases, we really are able to prevent many of the side effects and if not to prevent, to manage and lessen uh, many of the other side effects. And I just echo what Lily said, that speaking up about your side effects is really important. Um, we can see the ones that, you know, we detect on blood tests and things like that, but I'm not going to know if my patient is feeling queasy or had diarrhea yesterday, if she doesn't tell me, I'll know if she's dehydrated from her blood tests or her blood pressure, but I won't know if she has diarrhea and we have things we can suggest to manage loads of those side effects, either just from the treating team or in conjunction with palliative care, as Lily said. So speaking up is really, really important. And if the side effects are intolerable and impacting quality of life significantly, then you need to stand back and say, well, what should we do differently? Should we try a different treatment? Should we change the dose? Should we change the frequency of the treatment? Should we stop treatment and focus only on quality of life? Those are all questions. And so I think taking care of patients with metastatic breast cancer is sort of a one long ongoing conversation. And at every time point, we sort of stop and say, how are things going? Is this working for us? Is the disease controlled or not? Are the side effects and the symptoms of the disease controlled or not? If the answer is, yeah, everything's pretty good, the disease is under control and I'm feeling pretty well, we proceed. If the answer is no, we sit and we stop and we say, well, do we need any other testing? Do we need to consider other options? Do we need extra help from palliative care or other specialists such as integrative medicine providers or physical therapists or any other members of our team? Mm -hmm. Social workers, psychologists, people who can help with our mental health. There's a whole team of people who can help, but we need to sort of do a reassess. And, and it's an ongoing thing. We do it all the time. Every visit, there's kind of one something I, I seem to find. Um, and so take it, take it as it comes. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a very honest relationship mm -hmm. between the treatment team and, and the patient. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had a patient who had told me that uh, she was feeling worse. She suspected that her cancer had spread more. Um, and that in preparation for seeing her doctor, she decided to wear extra makeup she went dressed up and uh, she said, I even got my wig shampooed. And I said, why did you do that? She said, because I knew the doctor would say to me, wow, you look great today. And I said, so that's what you wanted to hear. And she said, yes. So I wouldn't have to tell him 
I'm feeling worse. And I said, mm, you're fooling yourself and then you're fooling the doctor because whatever's going on in your body isn't gonna go away because you got dressed up today. So it mm -hmm. taught me something important of, if I see someone and I say, wow, you look great today, I need to follow that with, do you feel as good as you look? Right, <laughs> exactly. No, and I think a lot of women, I would imagine do that. It's, I think it's very hard to just be point blank, you know, honest, like, here I am, throw it out there. And I, I, you know, both of you are right about that. It's really important just to, to just come in there, tell them exactly how you're feeling, how, how your days, weeks, months have been going, what's your family, the expectations of perhaps what they would like you to be doing, but can't be doing and et cetera. So I, you know, I, I think this is all really important information. Um, Dr. Smith, was, what uh, research, I'm sorry? I just wanted to add one thing that it's really important also to tell your treatment team ab about something important that's going on in your life. I've had so many patients who, you know, they, they want to go to a wedding or some event, and they're really surprised to find out that we can adjust the treatment schedule in many cases to allow for that. So for example, if their treatment was due on Friday, but the wedding is Saturday, what if we delay it until the next Monday so that they can go into the wedding, you know, mm -hmm. not having had treatment the day before? Um, there are very, it's very rare that we don't have a certain degree of flexibility and we, we don't think it's going to impact how effective the treatment is, but it's going to really impact how the patient feels and what she gets out of her life. And so speaking up about that stuff is really, really important and saying, Hey, I want to do this thing. What can you do to get me there? So, and it can be multiple things. So. Right. Yeah. And knowing those milestones far ahead is even more helpful. Um, so it isn't the, you know, the wedding is the next week, but I have a wedding in two months and I want to be feeling as good as I can on that day. Or my husband and I are celebrating our anniversary mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that's in, in six months. So how can we work around the schedule? Again, you just give cancer what it needs to get it into control. Don't let it steal away your joy, steal away these, these significant milestones. Uh, it, it doesn't deserve it. It doesn't. So Dr. Smith, what research is underway to improve the outcome for metastatic breast cancer? So um, as I said, there's been a ton of new drugs approved. Actually, the, the duration of time that patients uh, with metastatic breast cancer live with the disease has significantly increased in recent years. Um, for example, there are these uh, new class of drugs called the oral serves. This is a new type of anti-estrogen therapy that is uh, in develop development right now and looks to be really, really promising. So that's just one example. Another area of research in that, that is really, I, I think, changing the field is incorporation of uh, what we call next generation sequencing or molecular profiling. Mm -hmm. so, you know, the historical way and the, the standard way to think about breast cancer is those three subtypes that I mentioned, the hormone receptor positive, the triple negative, and the HER2 positive. But that's really just three markers. And if you think about how many other genomic or genetic changes there may be in any individual cancer, that there are tons, and many of them may represent additional targets for therapy. So now we are able to do this uh, genetic testing, both on the genes that you may have inherited from your mom or dad to see if it's a hereditary cancer and on the genes in the cancer specimen itself, sometimes actually that might be identified on blood tests. And we can find specific changes in the genes, alterations, overexpression, mutations. And that might tell us, well, hey, that mutation is there, therefore you should not use this treatment, but you might want to use that treatment. So this is um, a rapidly growing area of uh, breast cancer research and breast cancer treatment. There are several clear-cut um, examples where it's already made it into the standard of care, and there are many other examples of where 
identification of a specific genetic or genomic alteration can help identify a good clinical trial for a patient, such as if the patient has an alteration in a specific and there's a trial evaluating a drug that targets that specific um, alteration, that makes perfect sense. That's a good match for a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a really exciting uh, area for us. It's a whole new way of thinking about breast cancer. And it actually is bringing our basic science researchers in better contact with the clinical folks like myself. And we have these group meetings, which we call molecular tumor boards, where we discuss as a group, the scientists and uh, bioinformatics people and the clinicians, we review the results of these next generation sequencing tests to figure out what might be the best and most targeted therapy for each patient at each time. Thank you. So this is a good time now to transition over to our audience questions. And we'll start with Carol. And basically coming off of what you're saying, Dr. Smith, and she'd like to know how long can patients live with metastatic breast cancer? Are you able to have some kind of idea? So I don't think there's a maximum. Um, and I, I think that it really is variable depending on the pace of each person's uh, breast cancer. Um, there are statistics out there. Sometimes if you look online, you see numbers, they can be a bit misleading because sometimes the numbers group all the different types of breast cancer together. And um, as I was saying earlier, the, the length of time of the disease course does vary a little bit by subtype. For the hormone receptor positive and the HER2 positive breast cancer, we are talking years, like many years actually. And for the triple negative, it's definitely getting longer. We really have had some amazing developments recently. It's wonderful, it's good, good news. From uh, Juanita, she would like to know, is personalized treatment used for breast cancer patients? So maybe Lily and I will both take that in a slightly different way. I, there are lots of ways that we can personalize treatment. I'll speak to the genomic personalizing and I'll let Lily take the other personalizing. What I was just saying about the next generation sequencing these uh, mm -hmm. genetic assays, molecular assays, that's one way to kind of personalize because you're actually looking and saying, well, what are the genetic changes in this specific cancer and what drugs can I pick for that, as opposed to just saying, well, this is a drug that works in breast cancer in general. Mm -hmm. We're doing it based on the specific changes in the cancer. So that's molecular personalization. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lily. <laughs> Other personalization, which is equally, if not more important, I think, so. Yeah. So patient-centered care is personalized uh, treatment, personalized medicine, and it, it is factoring in what are her goals of care, um, what does she want to uh, accomplish uh, in the next six months or the next year, two years, et cetera? Are there um, specific milestones that are very important to her that are coming up that she wants to make sure that she can be here if we can possibly make that happen? Uh, I like to talk to patients also about looking at life goals, short-term life goals and long-term life goals. Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved with the care of many women that are in their early thirties and have toddlers that uh, that patient will say to me, I wanna be here to see my daughter get married. And I'm thinking, I think we're looking at two decades or more from now. Mm -hmm. And that may not be realistic. Uh, particularly depending on what her clinical situation is. So that would mean that I would embark on a discussion of uh, let's take a look at uh, that being a significant life goal that I may need to help you with in fulfilling it in an alternative way. And it isn't something that we need to talk about up front today, but as we see if the disease is progressing and treatments aren't working, and the treatments changes are happening faster and faster and are continuing to not be able to do their job, now, now's that time for that, for that alternative discussion, that different path, as I say, that, that the patient and I need to 
uh, need, need to go on together. And that's going to mean having cards for that little girl who's three years old right now. And when she gets married and she's 24, uh, she'll have a card to open, a wedding card from her mom. And her mother will have written in there uh, with a pen, not text or an email or typing, but actually with a blue pen, uh, writing in there her motherly advice, her hopes for her in her new life with this person that she has chosen and has chosen her. Uh, that's a card that will never be thrown away. And believe me, whatever advice she gives that child now who is an adult will, I guarantee you, um, adhere to that advice. I, I am privileged in hearing from children who are now grown mm -hmm. uh, that find me um, and say, I only knew your name was Lily and my mother died 14 years ago and I was 10 years old and I got married three weeks ago. And just as when I got my driver's license and graduated from high school and from college and got my first career job, et cetera, there was a card from my mom. There was a card from my mother. And, oh, wow. and yeah, and so yeah. I, uh, I know it's, it's not as good as being here, though I think spiritually oftentimes these women are right there for that wedding. But um, I wanna look at alternative ways rather than just saying, I'm so sorry you won't be here for mm -hmm. this, that, and the other of, let's figure out another way to, to still be able to make this happen. Mm -hmm. I love all of those ideas. It's, it, it's, it's really a, a, a lovely, lovely way to still be uh, included in your loved one's life. Very touching. Yeah, I have cards for my grandchildren. I hope I'm here to hand them to them. Mm -hmm. But if I get hit by a truck, I'm still in control. <laughs> my <laughs> voice will still be heard. And you get, they will know you get the last what I expect of them okay. at different milestones in their life. Well, and, and how much I love them. And, and it, it's <laughs> such a gift. That's, that's a lovely, lovely gift to give your loved one. A really wonderful idea. So our, moving on to our next question from Susan, uh, she'd like to know, are breast cancer survivors more apt to develop another type of cancer in the future? Um, overall, unless a, a patient has um, a specific genetic predisposition to breast cancer, the risk of other types of cancers like colon cancer, or lung cancer is not necessarily higher. Uh, that being said, having survived one type of breast cancer means you should definitely be really good about cancer screening for other types of cancer. So do mm -hmm. the colon cancer screening, do the avoiding, you know, red meat, all the healthy things that you can do to reduce the risk of getting a future cancer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, question from Andrea. How are circulating tumor cells, DNA, excuse me one second. Uh, I'm gonna repeat this again. Sorry, they come through on a text, so I apologize. Um, how are circulating tumor cells, DNA tests being used in the moder monitoring of MBC patients? Are they, and are they widely used or limited just to the cancer center patients? So we were talking a little bit about um, sort of the, all these genetic changes and things that you can uh, identify in cancer cells that might guide therapy. Um, those can be evaluated using a biopsy specimen. And there is sort of a new area where we can evaluate some of these things by a blood test. So um, in some cases, women with uh, cancer will, if you draw a blood test for circulating tumor cells, which is exactly what it sounds like it is, is cancer cells in the bloodstream, you will be able to detect them. And uh, cancer cells can also release little tiny fragments of their genetic information into the bloodstream. And that is called circulating tumor DNA, and that can be detected. Um, not, not all patients have these things in their blood, but some patients do. Um, in the case of the circulating tumor DNA, sometimes it can give us an idea about a specific mutation or alteration that can direct our therapy, so it gives us a specific target. There is a lot of research going on right now to figure out how best to use these tests. Um, I think they're really exciting and really interesting, 
but I don't think we yet really know uh, for sure how they correlate with the tissue findings. Um, how what happens if you assess them multiple times, uh, spread out, you know, every few months or every few weeks? What what the and what those changes that you may see with the levels going up or down or new alterations necessarily means. Um, I think people are starting to use them and starting to incorporate them into treatment, but I don't think that it's quite the standard of care yet. And there's a lot of clinical trials um, going on that are evaluating them. And so my recommendation is um, that if uh, people are going to be using them, that it's best to do as a part of a clinical trial so that we can get as much information as possible. Sure. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from Monica, and her question is, does having lupus or any other autoimmune disease increase the chance of developing breast cancer? Not that I am aware of. I there was one study is. done that showed there was not a correlation. That study was done like 13, 14 years ago. That's great. I think that um, the biggest risk factor for getting breast cancer is being a woman. And the second being a girl. Is yes. Getting older. And I think <laughs> that lupus is probably more common in women than in men, but beyond that. Yeah. Well, thank you. This is a question from Newton. Uh, she would like to know, are there any foods that slow, I guess, slow down a metastatic breast cancer? I don't know of any specific data in the metastatic setting demonstrating that a dietary change or a specific diet will change the course of the disease. Mm -hmm. Being said, um, we do have data in earlier stage breast cancer that weight is linked to how uh, women ultimately do with worse outcomes observed in patients who are overweight. Um, and we know that people generally feel better when they eat better. And so I think that the general recommendations for low fat, limited red meat, largely plant-based diet should be extended uh, to patients living with metastatic breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shockney, this is from Daphne, and she would like to know, we, we know there is support for patients with metastatic breast cancer, but how would you go about that if you really didn't have any resource, you know, just really didn't know anything about it? So how would you go about that to find that? So one of the things that, that we offer through Johns Hopkins, and I've also helped other breast centers across the country uh, develop these as well, is to be able to provide uh, metastatic breast cancer retreats. Uh, we hold two a year. One is for couples. Uh, so the patient brings her spouse or partner. Uh, I discourage people from bringing a brand new boyfriend. Um, that's not a couple yet. Uh, and uh, for women that are not in a relationship, we also offer a retreat so that, that those patients will bring a female caregiver which is oftentimes their mother, their sister, their daughter. In mm -hmm. some cases, it's even their best friend. These are three days and two nights. They are free to attend. You just have to provide your own transportation to, to get to me. We hold them at Bon Secours Spiritual Center in Marriott'sville, Maryland, 362 uh, acres of serenity. Uh, I've been doing these since 2006. I've done over 30. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, University of Kansas is holding so one I would, uh, I would right now. Bring your yeah, so they're they're happening in three places in Pennsylvania, in uh, three places in Texas, um, and uh, folks can email me and I can uh, help them locate one, hopefully in their area, or help them in in perhaps signing up for hours. We do limit it to twelve patients, so you really do get a lot of individual time. Mm -hmm. uh, I promise uh, patients and those that they bring, their loved one that they bring with them, you will have moments that you will cry. You will have moments that you will laugh and laugh until you're going to pee yourself. <laughs> Both will happen over three days and, and two nights. But you'll come away feeling more in control of your future mm -hmm. and what lies ahead. 
Well, thank you. As much as I would love to continue this conversation, because this is such important information, it looks like we've run out of time. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Karen Smith and Professor Lily Shockney and thank each of you for joining us this evening. Dr. Smith and Professor Lily Shockney have graciously agreed to respond to any, any unanswered questions that we've asked this evening. So in a couple of weeks, you'll receive an email outlining those outstanding questions and answers. In the coming days, a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey under conversations that matter. And if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey for information about the forthcoming special program on November 13th and announcements about future conversations and podcasts, all featuring Johns Hopkins physicians and faculty and brought to you by a woman's journey. In the meantime, we hope you'll find our monthly email informative and engaging. Thank you very much. Good night and stay well.